information here about Operation Christmas Child. So um, in this time of COVID, uh, things will need to be a little bit different, but it's even more important that we support the children um, who need a gift of love and hope over Christmas. So um, this year we've purchased some pre-printed boxes and for those of you who'd like to fill a box, you're quite welcome to collect a box from church. Um, we'll arrange for them to be available when you're in church, although I know um, numbers are limited at the moment. But if you want to contact Christine or Eileen, we can also arrange to get boxes to you. Another option, if you don't want to take a box and fill it, is to donate some items that can go into boxes that other people are packing. And, and if you just hold on to those items just now until we let you know um, when we can take them in church. You can also donate money towards sending the boxes. That would be a really valuable thing to do. It costs um, five pound a box to get them across to the children. And some of the things we need for those boxes, if you'd like to contribute, are things like um, hairbands and clasps, ribbons for, for hair, coloured pencils and crayons, combs, bigger size hats and gloves for the older children, individually wrapped soaps, small balls, um, Willie usually collects tennis balls for us, and some wind up torches and small cars, just little things like that. This year we can't put in sweets, chocolate, no toothpaste, no liquids including bubbles, and if you've got any questions you can ask Eileen. Um, Eileen's on 01576 610572 and my number is 01461 201347. Thank you.
as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, come, come. Good morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. I'm recording this a week before it goes out, so I'm hoping that what is true of what will now be last Sunday is true of this Sunday. But glorious Sunday morning, actually quite hard to deal with the sun that's just missing my eyes. I must move very slightly straight into my eyes, but it's a privilege to be sharing in worship with you this morning and I hope very much that what happens today will speak to you at some level and in some way and in some way will be helpful for you and helpful to you. Let's worship God together. Isaiah 45 verses 1 to 4 says this. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by your name, I surname you, though you do not know me. Let us pray. Lord God, we tend to project ourselves onto heaven and see an image of ourselves where we should see you. This is our sin. This is our rebellion. This is the problem. We cry out and our voices echo in the emptiness we have created. And yet you call to us and in the stillness we hear those ancient words. You level the mountains and you break open the doors of bronze and the bars of iron. You break through our ambition and our delusion, and you create something new. So we come to you today, looking for forgiveness, willing to set the past aside, in that hope of becoming the new people that you call us to be. And in the darkness there is light, and in hopelessness there is hope, and the dead end turns out to be the way forward. The end, the beginning. Death itself becomes resurrection. And today as we look at ancient words and at a story which is familiar, may we hear what it is that you are saying to us, and what you are calling us to do, to be, to become. Open our eyes to the bigger picture, to the truth, to what it was that allowed people who had no idea who he was or what he was supposed to be, or how he would be seen by future generations, to recognise in Jesus as he spoke to them, the truth. May we experience that truth today, the kingdom, the way, the life, that he preached and that he was. Today may it be real for us, as it was real for them. Amen.
amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see was grace that taught my heart to fear in grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. The Lord has promised good to me His word, my hope, secures He will my shield and portion me As long as life soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be Forever mine, you are forever mine. Our reading today is from the New Testament, Luke chapter 15, reading verses 11 through to 32. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. 
He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen. For all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The parable of the prodigal son is, along with the parable of the Good Samaritan, undoubtedly the best known out of all of Jesus' stories. It's a gift to Sunday school teachers, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, everyone. Even a child reads this and recognises that it's not a simple story of one man at one time, but like all of the great stories of every world tradition, this is a story which applies in different situations and different circumstances to different people. And there can be very few of us who have not at some time in our lives, or perhaps many times in our lives, been exceptionally grateful that this story was told by Jesus, recorded in Luke's Gospel, because we have felt that we have been in the position of the prodigal son, the younger son in the story. That in some way we have relied on the forgiveness, the welcome, the embrace of God. We hear this in these circumstances and these situations as a very simple story of a younger son who oversteps the mark in some ways demands what is his and goes his own way. He goes off into a strange land, leaves everything that is familiar, wastes money, wastes time, in many ways appears to waste his life, finds himself destitute and alone, abandoned, and comes back, we would say with his tail between his legs, but it's much more than that. He comes back humbled, broken, to seek not his father's forgiveness, but some kind of a deal which will allow him to live 
as a farm worker or an estate worker on his father's property. When his father steps outside of the property, he embraces him and he reinstates him. And we hear that and we're grateful for that story. We're grateful for what it tells us about who God is and how God's love works. And it's perhaps the first real mark of spiritual maturity that we recognise that in the prodigal son, the younger son, something of ourselves and something of our own journey. But this is a story that can be read and heard and understood at all kinds of levels, many levels. It's very important to recognise the context of the story. And whether this is the purpose of the story or this is just an important part or a trigger for Luke's listeners and Jesus' hearers. But in the world of first century religion in the ancient Near East, two religions were born in the first century. One was Christianity and the other was Judaism as we know it. And in the church itself, where the first converts were Jews, there very quickly arose a dispute, a divide. And you can read about that if you read the letters of Paul in particular. You can read about it in Acts. The church was divided on one issue. For someone who wasn't of a Jewish background, there was a group in the church, the Jewish group, which said that you had, before you were baptised, to submit to the requirements of the Jewish law. And there was a group which said that you didn't, that baptism and all that that symbolised, that conversion process, was all that you needed. And so you have a picture here where the older brother becomes the Jewish faction, if you like, in the church, which said you have to keep to the rules. And the younger son, he comes back from his journey, now the outsider, and he represents the rest of the world. And the father stands for God in a sense that he welcomes and embraces the outsider with no reference to the rules. And so this becomes a very pro one side of the church story. At the very least, these issues and these questions will have been in the minds of those who first read Luke's Gospel, because this was what the church was. This was where the division, this was where the dispute in the church lay. But there isn't necessarily a right way and necessarily a wrong way to read this story. What we do have to make sure though is that we don't end up reading it as a story about other people. As if we understand and other people don't. What we have to remember at all times is that the Gospels, including Luke's Gospel, were not written for people who had no religious belief. And neither did Jesus, in his ministry, find himself in dispute with people who said, well, I don't believe in God, or I am against religion. Jesus and the early church were addressing the message of the kingdom to people who were profoundly and deeply embedded in religion. They believed in God. They believed passionately in religion. The issue was always religion that has gone wrong. So this story told to people for whom and among whom 
and because of whom sometimes religion had gone wrong. We're going to this story was aimed at them, and it was going to affect them, and we have to to look at what that means. This is not a story for children. It's not a story for those who have yet to become part of the church. It's in a document, a book, Luke's Gospel, which was written for the church, and in the church, and by the church. And we've got to recognise what it's saying then to religious people. We've got to recognise what it might be saying to us. It's a real cliché to talk, and people do talk about this being the parable of the elder son. The elder son has a very, very important part to play. And we can easily become, and we can easily be, and we probably are now, to some extent, the older brother. But we have to recognise that in this, we've got to watch each one of the players, the father, the older brother and the younger brother. We've got to watch who they are, what they do, how they are, and how they change. The father doesn't change. The older brother doesn't change. But the younger son does. A namesake of mine, but no relation, a man by the name of Joseph Campbell, wrote a book called The Hero's Journey. He was very, very interested in comparative religion, religious studies. And he studied stories from different cultures, different places and different languages. And he recognised that there is an overarching theme, and it is the theme of The Hero's Journey. And you'll find it not only in the story of the parable of the prodigal son, but in Jesus' story. You'll find it in many books, films, legends, plays. You'll find it in art everywhere. It's this archetypal story of the man or the woman who through their own volition or otherwise leave home and they go on a journey and they go through some traumatic experience and then they return home. And when they come home, they have a message to impart, some news, some truth for the community to which they're now returning because they have changed. And if you look at the younger son, this is the journey upon which he goes. He goes on the hero's journey. He's entitled to do what he did and to ask for his inheritance. It is his share, it is his right. And he goes off, but there's a twist in the story. There are two twists in the story that are really, really important. One is that he finds himself not only working among pigs, but wanting to eat what they ate. Now that tells you that he's in a non-Jewish world. A Jew wasn't allowed to touch pigs. But Jews weren't allowed to touch non-Jews either. So this leads on to the other important thing. So the, the, the younger son goes off and is contaminated. It isn't his dissolute living, but it is the touching of the pigs, which will have shocked the Jewish audience. So he comes back completely contaminated, unclean, they would have said. And his father sees him, and his father steps outside of the community, if you like. Because when religion goes wrong, what religion does, and churches do it, they start to keep people out. We preach a message of inclusion, we preach a message of love, but we keep people out. If you look at the Church of Scotland, one of the two biggest battles in the last 50 or just over 50 years, women in the eldership and ministry, huge battle. But at the end of the 1960s, women were admitted to first to the eldership and a year later to the ministry. The whole question of inclusion of LGBT people, that is currently dividing the church. Now, whatever you think about either of these debates, you can see how very, very quickly, if you follow the debates, 
It's not about including people, it's about excluding people. The early church had the non-Jewish world knocking on the door of the church, banging on the door of the church trying to get in. And you had half the church trying to keep them out, and then half the church looking at this in a different way, and it became a gospel imperative, a kingdom imperative, to welcome in the stranger. Now the story of the prodigal son leans heavily and borrows heavily on other stories, especially the story of Jacob and Esau, which you can read in Genesis, where it's not the father and the son, but the two brothers who are reconciled. And again, you have the stepping forward out of the community. So the father steps, the, the father's not allowed to touch the son. You notice he says, you were dead to me, right? He is dead to the father. He's abandoned everything that he's supposed to adhere to, everything that is supposed to give meaning to his faith and to his life. So while he's still contaminated, while he's ritually unclean, if you like, the father steps outside of the community, steps outside of his household, steps outside, if you like, of the law and the rules, and he embraces the son. And what you have here is a dilemma then in your mind. Has the father broken the law? Or in this parable, do we suddenly see what the regulations and what the rules and what the Jewish law means and meant. That it's not what we thought it was, but it's about love and it's about inclusion and it's about openness. So you have the father embracing the son and welcoming him back. The son approaches the father wanting to do a deal, wanting to discuss the rules, wanting to discuss terms. And yet the father steps outside of the rules, embraces him, and he recognises what it is to be a son. And then you have the older brother, who's enraged, and you can understand that. The older son who's kept the rules, but has never quite understood, in the way that the younger son and the father now understand it, what it means to be a son. Remember Paul speaks about adoption. This is grace. The younger son, having returned from his journey, is the one who teaches us, along with his father, what the relationship between God and the rest of us is. But we are not called to see God in the father. This parable calls us to become the Father. This is how we are to be. Because we are like the younger son in relation to God, we have to be as the Father is here to everyone else. That is the basis of our relationship. And if you remember in the list of instructions and commandments we looked at again from Luke's Gospel last week, there was that one, do not judge. And you see here a commentary on that. Because the older brother demonstrates that as soon as we exclude one person, as soon as we seek to judge one person, it is not they, but we, who are excluded from the party. The party, that feast, for that read communion. And for communion, read kingdom. We exclude ourselves from what it is to be part of this family, what it is to attend this meal, what it is to be part of this community when we exclude anyone else. This parable can be read at so many different levels that when you look at the Father, recognize that this is Luke's gospel and this is Christ himself telling us who and what we are to be and what it is that we are to become. i mm -hmm.
and stories of what they think you're like But I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're a good, good father Searching for answers far and wide But I know we're all searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know just what we need Before we say a word You're a good, good father speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into Let us pray. Lord God, it is very cliched to say, but it's true. It's far easier to be the older brother than it is to be the father in Jesus' story. And yet you call us not to admire, but to imitate, not to cheer or to applaud, but to become what we see acted out not simply to watch or, or to spectate, but to be part of the story. The beauty and the difficulty of the parable of the prodigal son is that we are actors. We are the players. We're in that story all of the time. 
we are the characters. We recognise ourselves. This is the story of our lives, our attitudes, our actions, our interactions and reactions all of the time. The Father reflects you, Lord God, and yet he isn't you. He is what we become when we are so tied up, not in ourselves, but in you. When we listen to you, when we recognise the truth, when we act, when we become disciples. That father in the story is as Christ is to us. He is as you are, Lord God. He is as your truth, your love demands we must be. He is what your love demands we have to be to other people, no matter how difficult or impossible the situation or how unforgivable or beyond redemption the person or relationship or circumstance or action appears to be. This is how you break down the bronze gates of which Isaiah speaks. The barriers, the iron bar, it was never power but love, not almighty, but all transforming love. Not the cheap grace of what we believe that you can do, but the costly grace of what you call us to do, to be and to become. And so today we pray that we may become your people, adult and responsible with minds reset on you reprogrammed, renewed, ready to go where you want us to go, in the way you call us to go, at the speed, the rhythm which you alone said. We pray for our own community, for neighbours, for the church, for the churches, the congregation, the congregations to which we belong in this time of isolation. We don't pray like children asking for someone else to do what they cannot do, but we pray knowing that the very act of praying like this demands that we change so that our relationships with family, friends, neighbours, strangers, enemies, every one of these relationships changes, so that our community changes, so that the world changes, Lord, let the change for which we look and pray and yearn and dream begin with us today. With what we share, with what we are willing to surrender and to sacrifice, with what we are willing to give for the sake of someone else and for the kingdom of God. Today be with the bereaved, the lonely, the isolated, the sick, everyone who is finding today difficult. And in a few moments of silence, we name those we know who need the prayers of the church. In the silence, we name them and their needs. These are our prayers. Hear us, hear them, change us, use us. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not Inspiration, I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Jesus Christ, my living.
Go in the peace of God to be makers of peace. In the love of God to take love to those who lack it and need it. In the presence of God to be present physically where possible with those who feel isolated, abandoned and alone. And thus may you find, know and live in the blessing of God. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit this day, tomorrow and forever. Amen.